Let's talk about soil, because when we talk about agriculture, we need to talk about soil. And this here um, is a very poor soil. You could call it dirt. It's close to desert. And that's what remains after you drain a swamp and plow it for decades. All the carbon, all the humus went up into the atmosphere where it shouldn't be. And it's not in the soil. It's not retaining water anymore. It's not allowing fertility anymore. And the big part about regenerative ag agriculture is to get carbon back into the soil, but also to get life back into the soil. Because something we very often do not comprehend is that soils are super crazy, fascinating living systems. Uh, extremely complex. From macro, meso, micro, shitloads of life happening there. And they are all connected, these life forms. You know, you have all the viruses and bacteria and all the fungi. You have the anthropos... Uh, English. Yeah, like little thingies and bigger thingies, from worms to molds and evolves and everything yeah, eats each other and when it dies and decomposes it gets eaten again from the little things. And the fascinating stuff is that soil itself is not mm, contained, it's interacting with the above ecosystem, mostly plants, via roots. No, roots in the soil are super essential. And when we look at this amazing creature plant, um, there's a trick they can do, many other creatures can't do. Uh, and I'll use a well-known comparison. They are little solar panels photosynthesis plants take oxygen uh, carbon <laughs> carbon dioxide sunlight water nutrients and they start to build organic <coughs> mass it's the beginning of all organic matter on this planet photosynthesis it started somewhere in the water then it moved to land and plants are the very interlinkage between this fascinating nuclear power plant that's hanging up in the sky and um, life and as farmers we are all in the solar business no, we are converting sunlight into food for animals or humans and that's the whole deal to do that effectively we need a living soil because living soil means fertile soil with this interaction through roots because the microbiomes of the soils are not only interacting among each other, they're interacting with the plants. And a lot of the sunlight that is harvested by the plant is shared via root exudates with the microbiome of the soil. Yeah, it's basically sugars or long and short chain carbohydrates that get pushed through the roots into the soil. The soil microbiology comes towards the rhizosphere and the plant feasts on the metabolic product of this microbiome of the soil. And there are millions and billions of interlinked relations there. And we are just starting to understand the complexity of it and are still at the very beginning. What we can understand though are patterns. Patterns that have been taking place for millennia and billions of years actually. And one of these patterns is diversity. Diverse systems are resilient, diverse systems are very often very rich in life. And that also makes sense. Now, if we think uh, in other complex adaptive systems like finance, for example, you would also diversify your portfolio. Now, you're not always putting stuff on one card. Resilience means if environment changes, some die and others can take over. Nature doesn't do monocrops. Nature only works in polycultures. And the more diversity we have in the soil, the more likely it is to supply a wide array of above ground diversity. And that brings resilience to our ecosystems. So working diverse and not monocultural is one very important point. And as we now enter the garden, I invite you to not only look at it and listen to me, but also listen a little bit to the insects around and maybe see the birds and butterflies and like the all, the all the different kinds of impressions, they can give you a little bit of the insight how 
alive the system is. We can also taste it a little bit to add to the sensations. And as we walk into the garden now, it's a very nice example case how we can try to turn dirt into soil while producing awesome food. And the garden is a good example because it's super, super highly productive. And if we want to maintain or even regenerate ecosystem health in a super high productive system, we can't do that without giving a lot. Now you can't take more than you give. But you can try to reduce your giving by allowing nature to do its magic. Yeah, reduce our technical inputs and replace them with the awesomeness of biology. That's just happening because it's happening since ever. <laughs> and um, for that we need to understand how it was happening forever. Yeah, what's the systems that kept soils fertile and increased ecosystem abundance? And one of the early organic pioneers um, of the Bioland stuff, he said, like, how is soil acting in nature? It's always covered and it's always rooted. And so there is a living plant on the soil and the soil wants to be covered. If we walk into the forest, there's always a cover on the soil. And that's for a very good reason. So bare soil is a malfunction and nature tries to cover it very quickly, for example, with weeds. So if we create bare soil, we need to cover it very quickly. And that's why we mulch. Coming to one of the first three, I would say, regenerative tenants of the market garden. Mulching is basically covering soil with organic matter. Here you see an example of mulching with sheep wool. And this is from the sheep we had one and a half years ago. And that is not there to keep the plants warm. It's there to give an armor to the soil. Three very big benefits of mulching. Protection, armor from sun uh, drying up, from wind and water erosion. Uh, we can easily imagine the raindrop that hits the soil is like a little bomb and carries soil away. If it first hits a mulching layer or an active leaf, the energy is taken off and it can infiltrate slowly. It's also a fodder chamber for microbiology. The sheep wool starts to rot very slowly, but it starts to rot. And the worms can now take a little bit of this rotting matter and take it into their breeding channels. And with that, actually start to put organic matter down into the soil without plowing it. Leads me to the second cause. No? This action of the worms is called bioturbation, yeah? the integration of the surface organic matter into deeper levels of the soil. And when you look at a plow, we do that with disturbance, mechanical disturbance. We turn residues into the soil. But with this disturbance, we also disturb the microbiome. And uh, I'll lend my metaphor from Christine Jones. Um, we spoke about soil as a complex living system. A little bit difficult to comprehend. We can also say soil is like a city. And in the city we have different quarters. Some people live in St. Pauli, others in Blancanese. And you know your ways to school and you know where your favorite bar is. And you know basically your ways around your ecological niche. You also have different compartments, uh, story buildings. No? Some sit in the nice penthouse and drink their caipirinhas and others sit in the basement and work from the computer. And when you start shifting the soil around and you turn these quarters upside down and suddenly the penthouse is in the basement and has a little flue and the basement is in the penthouse and gets a sunburn and the Blancanese dude doesn't find his way to school because now he's in St. Pauli, that stresses an organism. And stressed organisms don't perform. Right? So we try to minimize stress and soil disturbance and let the ecological niche where it is. But why do we plow then since thousands of years? We work annual ecosystems and an annual ecosystem um, is not very good in succession so we need to reset it and that's why we plow, we reset the ecosystem. Also the stressed organism might die and the nutrients that have been bound in its biomass get plant available. 
This is okay if we understand that plowing is a very, very um, strong attack on soil biology and we give it time and rest and help to recover. But in the last years of industrialization, we have used plowing a little bit reluctantly and we plowed a lot. And in addition, we apply a lot of plant protection or biocides. Herbicides against weeds, pesticides against pests and fungicides against any kind of mushroom. And this is life. And a lot of it is microbial as well. So if we protect our plants by applying agricultural poisons and we disturb the biome all the time, there's very little chance to regenerate. Luckily, microbiology is fast because it's very small and it reproduces a lot. And if we apply good soil management, there is good chance that soils can recover. But we need to understand that soils need to be alive and diverse and we need to feed this diversity and this life with good management practices. Mulching is one of them, not plowing or plowing with a very conscious uh, mindset can be another one. And the third one is biointensivity or biointensity, biointensity. Mm -hmm. We plant very densely together and we try to combine different planting families. We will see that when we look into agroforestry a little bit. But basically the idea is a lot of solar panel per square meter, which increases your yields, also increases your root exudates. Now we remember the plant doesn't take all the sunlight for itself, it shares some of it. And then the rhizosphere is the hottest bar in town. All the microorganisms go to this root and they feast on the liquid sunlight. Uh, we use shitloads of different mulching materials. Uh, one of our main ones is compost. Mm -hmm. uh, we do use technical mulching materials. Sheep wool here is mainly for the long-standing cultures. So if you look here at the Brussels sprouts uh, and the strawberries and the rhubarb are perennials, because it rots very slow. So it's a good protection. And I gave you already the advantage of the uh, food chamber and the protection. The last one would be it also suppresses weeds or plants we do not want to cultivate. That would be in concurrence with our um, cultured plants. So if we reduce the weed pressure by mulching, we actually give a competitive advantage to our uh, crop. And that nicely weaves into a disadvantage of the biointensity. Planting so densely together gives us more solar panel and gives us more root exudates and gives us also a mulching layer through the canopy of the crops, no? because the leaves touch each other. But it also means we cannot easily mechanically cultivate with machines, because the plants are very dense together and machines need space to work. So we work with these two machines. And in this garden with about 3,000 square meters, we employ four full-time gardeners during the season. That's shitload of salary for a very little area. Mm -hmm. And accordingly, we have to be very smart about our systems. And mulching in a good way and suppressing weeds reduces the workload and the time we spend there. Uh, also, planning is a big part. No? Not everything is bad in the industry. Standardization also has its advantages. We just need to be always weighing it and rating it in a good context. These beds are all 20 meters long and they're all 75 centimeters wide. That's a standard, so we can easily predict harvests, we can easily predict the needed amount of seed, we can easily choose the mulching materials or the row covers and we don't need to ah, get the 12 meter one and the 60 meter one. No, so there is a standard to it and it's easy to manage or easier to manage. We do grow unprofitable crops like onions for example because uh, or also a good example beans and peas, legumes. Now they are little amazing buggers because they can take nitrogen from the soil uh, from the air and actually the symbiotic microbiome makes this nitrogen plant available. Legumes have been in every crop rotation, but uh, since Haber and Bosch learned to take nitrogen with high pressure and high temperature, we have started to neglect them a little bit. And now we feed 
chemically synthesized nitrogen instead of biologically synthesized.